hello again, everybody. Welcome inside the Vibeland Sports Studios. Guys, I'm back. He's back. Have back I worked my way back up? I, I think so. I heard I had been banished to interim. Yeah, uh, intern status last week. Well, yes, and your verdict's still out. We'll see how this episode goes. But for now, we'll, we'll just go ahead and pencil you in for the host role for at least the rest of this season. There's a lot of meetings, a lot of what have yous. You know, a lot, lot of bridges to cross, a lot of T's to dot, eyes to wait, T's to dot, eyes to not, nah, T's to cross, eyes to dot. You know, yeah. Make sure you're dotting all your T's out yep. there. Well, I, obviously, it's come down to you and I as to who's going to host this thing because this guy next to me is. I don't even get eyes and T's out. I don't right, even know so. what shape letters are. Hey, I haven't seen you since our great weekend a couple of weekends ago. That's right. Uh, I thought maybe it just took me a little longer to recover than it did you. Oh, man. Toby Keith Golf Tournament, always a very fun time for Didn't a great like the cause. Format. Didn't like the format. No, no. For, for a very great cause, though, and it, it was fun. Uh, we ended up, instead of playing Scramble, they put us in an alternate shot tournament, which, I mean, as much as I was... Standing for match play, I hate alternate shot just as much. Uh, and really, the only person I've ever played a good alternate shot round with is my dad. When I used to play uh, with him every day. Uh, other than that, no thanks. Yeah, it wasn't a lot of fun. Although they tried to change the format on us, and Team Stay Hot Sports still finished at a tie. We stayed for hot. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I'm they telling tried you. Tried to throw every curveball at you, huh? They did. And we still knocked it out of the park. There you I'm go. All right, guys, uh, let's talk a little U.S. Open. Before we do that, let us promo today's show. We've got a great guest lined up, Mickey Tettleton, who will be going into the Oklahoma Sports Hall of Fame, one of a number of inductees in a very strong class here in 2019, will be our guest. He spent 14 years in the majors with the likes of Oakland, Baltimore, Detroit, and the Rangers. Was it a Major League Baseball All-Star? He also was a winner of a couple of Silver Slugger Awards. Currently the hitting coach at Oklahoma Christian University, Mickey Tettleton, joins us in our next segment. That will be fun. Also, if you've not followed our uh, account, either on Twitter or Instagram, you can do so at Vibeland Sports. And, of course, we will be unveiling our Vibeland Sports fan poll question of the week after we break down our loan topic this week. It is U.S. Open Week here in America, and they will be at Pebble Beach. Last time we saw the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach, it was a historic route for Tiger Woods. I don't think we'll ever see that again, not by Tiger or anybody else. I think the field is just too strong now. But, man, Cassidy, you're a big Woods fan. Reminisce about that. I mean, that was, that was uh, as I mentioned, of historical proportions, that route. That was one of the most fun golf tournaments that I can personally remember watching. Uh, I was young, but, man, what a unbelievable performance. And the way that he just – made that course what he wanted it to. He was playing it how how he was going to play it, did not care what anyone else was doing. Everyone else was out there grinding away, could not even, I mean, come close to what he was doing that weekend. One of the greatest four rounds of golf, really, I've ever seen by anyone in a major. As they said today, I believe, on the Golf Channel, they said that he was standing all alone on the Monterey Peninsula, and the rest of the field was on the tip of South Africa. <laughs> I mean, that's that was the wide gulf that they had in 2000 between Tiger Woods and the rest of the field. Again, even if Tiger were healthy, still in his prime, we'll never see anything like that again. They're making these golf courses much, much more difficult. But, boy, what a round that was for Tiger Woods. Let's start by saying, Tiger, does he have a chance this week? He's a 10-to-1 favorite, tied for third with – Last week's Canadian Open winner and Rory McIlroy. I like Tiger's odds this week. Again, you know, we talked about it kind of around the last major. He, I think he had taken a little bit too, too much time off after uh, winning the green jacket. So I think he's refocused, and I think the last major where he doesn't even make the cut humbles him a bit where he knows the preparation that needs to go into this course. And, and I don't think he's going to take that large margin of victory from the past and you know, use that as comfort. It's going to let him know, hey, I can do this, but I'm not the same golfer, and the field is not the same field. So I like his chances. I think his head is a, a little bit back to level. Uh, I think he's humbled himself since the green jacket win, and he knows what it uh, takes to prepare for this. So I like his chances. I don't think he's going to do it, but I do like his chances. I, I do. I think he's going to do it. Uh, may, call me this irrational Tiger Woods fan, but the, what he did at the memorial, closing the way that he did, it seemed like he kicked it into an extra gear, and it looked like he was trying to close out a major. Now, he wasn't in contention at that tournament. 
but he did find a way to get into the top 10 and had just an unbelievable Sunday uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I think seeing him play at that level, that gives me faith that he can do it. Uh, I, I think he's going to. I think that we're going to see Tiger right back there near the top of the leaderboard for most of this weekend. And look, if you're going to give me Tiger Woods versus the field on Sunday, if they're all pretty close, I'm going to take Tiger almost wow. every time. Okay, awesome. I'm going to tell you, I don't think Tiger wins it. Um, and here's why. And I get why he's doing what he does. Now, I do agree with you. I think he's going to be on the first page of the leaderboard. I think he's going to be a factor because he plays so well at Pebble Beach. I just don't think he's playing enough golf right now. And I get why he's not doing that. Because last year he played too much. By the time he got to the the playoffs, he had nothing left. I mean, he is not a young guy anymore. He's gone through numerous surgeries. So I understand why he's not playing every week. But I do think you need to be a little bit more consistent at his age, still trying to come back completely the way he did um, to win majors or at least have a chance week in and week out. But you have to like his chances. I don't think he wins this tournament. But just based, as I said, where it's where it's at, Tiger should be in the, in the hunt. Yes, and I think where he's at in his career right now, it's a lot easier for him to get up for four days and be at his peak for those just four days and then maybe take a month or two off than it is for him to be in that groove week in and week out like we've seen him for large portions of his career where he'll just go on a three-year streak where he doesn't miss a cut. I mean, he's done crazy stuff like that. Uh, for most of his career, but now that he's back, I, I think uh, he's being very strategic about the tournaments he's playing, and he's I think he's got it all figured out. Here's why I don't think he wins. I, I really like Brooks Kepkin. I know that that's really not going out on a limb, but you can't talk about major tournament golf anymore without mentioning Brooks Kepka. And you think back to Tiger's win at Augusta. As great as it was, and as well as Tiger played, if Kepka just bogeys one hole, Tiger probably didn't win that golf tournament. That's I mean, Brooks Kepka, Kepka is the modern-day Tiger Woods in majors. He is going to be up there and have a chance to win every single major. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to do it, but, boy, I like Kepka. I know that's that's not really going out on too much of a limb. but uh, Hey, I'm right there on that short limb with you, so that's that was going to be my pick. Like you said, not much of a limb to go out on, but the way he's playing golf right now and dominating the golf course, it's hard to pick against Kepka right now. I mean, Todd – I was going to say this. I mean, I'm jumping out on the same limb you are, and I was going to say he is the modern-day Tiger. So you kind of took the words right out of my mouth on that. So I'm all in on Kepka. There's so many people that can win it, but there's just certain guys that are real special when it comes to majors. Yeah, he's Dustin Johnson is more talented than anybody in the world, but he's not consistent week in and week out in terms of majors. Most of the time he finds himself in contention, but there's times where he will really struggle and be on the second or third page of a major leaderboard. And his erratic driving at times can get him in trouble, especially in a tournament like the U.S. Open. Here's the thing. It's not going to be necessarily at Pebble Beach who drives the ball the best. It's going to be who has the best short game because those greens are very unforgiving at Pebble Beach and they're very, very small. So if Tiger has a good short game, he's got a chance. We know Kepka does. Can Dustin Johnson, Cassidy, have a good short game? I think so. Uh, I think that where Dustin Johnson can help himself out, though, is from the tee. If he can stay consistent, be in the fairway, he hits it so far that he's going to be hitting a little bit shorter club, makes it easier to hold those small greens. And I think that's kind of where all of his uh, – advantage can start if he can start sticking it up there and he's only got an eight footer for birdie and not having to worry about scrambling around for uh to save par uh that's where he's he can really make up a lot of strokes on the field but again like you said i think for him it all comes down to his his driver because i think that sets the table for him uh if he starts springing around then it puts it all on his short game i don't know if he has the short game to make it happen so for all those guys, for Kepka alike, uh, man, I just he's a machine. I, I'd like to see what he's going to do to this course. I think he's going to tear it up. But there, I, also, Rory McIlroy is a guy that has really been playing well, coming off of a win in Canada. Uh, he has been playing well 
in for most of this season, had one of his better seasons, uh, just hasn't performed in the majors. And I wonder if this is one where we're going to see Rory step up and be on the top page of the leaderboard. Rory is coming off his best performance in a long time. He's shot 22 under par to win wow. the RBC Canadian Open last weekend. KP, here's my thing on Rory, and I do like Roy McIlroy a lot. Always have. Always been a fan of his. But Rory, if you look at his career, it's really up and down. And there's not weeks of three or four or five or six good weeks in a row. Now, that lends me to believe that he can put back-to-back good weeks together, and maybe that does make him a good fact, uh, a force in this tournament. Had it been a month away, mm-hmm. I don't think he is the factor, but I think coming off that 2200 performance and being back-to-back, I think he has a chance to be a real Absolutely. Factor. And you look at his 2019 season. I mean, he's dominating out there. He has had ex- I mean, he's had just top 10 finish after top 10 finish. But like Cassidy said, it's what is he going to do in the majors? That's kind of where you don't hear his name. It's you hear his name every week except really the majors. That's kind of when you hear about him a little less and, you know, maybe he can uh, put that one to rest and take care of that this weekend at the U.S. Open. Uh, You know he would like to because, like I said, the season he's having, he should be performing better in majors. We would be talking about what a dominant season he's had if he could just perform better in these majors. I think the story of 2019 golf, I mean, you're not going to get away from Tiger winning uh, (laughs) the green jacket. You're not going to get away from that, but a nice little sub would be Roy McIlroy's dominance, and we can't really talk about that because of the way he's performed in these majors. KP, do you agree with Cassidy and I when we both say we think Tiger is a factor this weekend and has a chance to be on the top 10 of the leaderboard oh. on Sunday for the first time since 2010? 100%. I would be – I'm going to go ahead and use the word shocked if Tiger is not in the top 10 at the end of this thing. Shocked. I think – again, I don't, I'm just not comfortable going on that limb saying he's got. he's going to win it. I say he's definitely got a chance, but if you're putting a gun to my head, I got to pick Kepka. But uh, I'm not going to go take the field like Cass- or take uh, Tiger versus the field like Cassidy would. But I would think about it for a second. So there's that. <laughs> well, after seeing him win the Masters, honestly, I-, I feel like Tiger Woods could win any tournament that he enters for the next decade. Uh, that gave me that much confidence in him. He uh, he just. I, I think he's there. Mentally, it's all back now, everything that he needs. And I think that was the last piece of his game that he was missing because back when he was Tiger Woods in the early 2000s and was just mowing down all the competition, it was what he did uh, between the ears that really stuck him out above head and shoulders everyone else. And I think he's getting back there. I've got a long shot. And he's not a real big household name, but he's becoming more and more on a weekly basis. He's 25 years old, Alexander Shoffley. Remember that. I think Alexander Shoffley makes a big, big run this week at Pebble Beach. Here's why. He currently ranks in the top 15 in scoring average, birdie average. That should give him a very good shot at winning at Pebble Beach. Yes. He's already won twice this year on the PGA Tour. And he has top 10 finishes in one of the other two majors this year at Augusta National. And he finished in the star-studded Waste Management Phoenix Open of the top 10 as well. Alexander Shoffley, he's 25 to 1 on the odds. I like him to certainly be in the top 10 this week. Shoffley's a, a guy that has been steadily working his way up uh, into the, the higher high echelons of golf. And look, I think he's on that top tier or maybe just below it. Uh, he is still just so young. I think I need to see him win a major, and then the ceiling is the limit for, for this kid. Uh, he, he can really do just about whatever he wants. Speaking of guys that may be a little bit outside that we don't know what they're going to do, what about Ricky Fowler, and where has he been kind of the last couple of months? I know we talked about it earlier in the season uh, that Ricky ha- was going to have a good season. We keep talking about every major. When is he going to show up? Is this the one that we see Ricky do some damage? I've been high on him all year and have picked him for both the majors when we've talked about it this year because exactly what you're saying. It's just it seems like it was Ricky's time. He was, I said it before on the show, he was winning tournaments tough after struggling, coming back and still getting the, the win. So it just everything, the stars were aligning for Ricky to go ahead and win one, but I'm kind of, jumping off that train a little bit just because he's been so inconsistent this year. Um, Driving hasn't been great. Short game hasn't been great. So he's got to put it all together. He definitely has the ability to do it. 
I don't Cassidy brought it up earlier, you know, is he going to be the next Phil Mickelson, the greatest golfer not to win a major? And I was saying, oh, I don't think he's there yet. But then we started looking at age and when Phil did it, he's closer than I thought he was. So I'm not ready to say have that conversation just yet, but it's something to think about. And it's time for Ricky to step up and, you know, take that next step. And he's ready to do it. I'm just ready to see him do it. Ricky Fowler has all the gifts to win a major championship. In fact, to be a multiple major championship winner. But the bottom line is he doesn't know how to win one yet. And people can poop all that statement all they want. Until he wins one, he doesn't know how to win one. Mm -hmm. He's been in contention in some, but has never gotten to the top spot in one of the big four golf tournaments. What about Jordan Spieth? He seems to be playing better after a really disappointing 2018. Does Spieth, guys, maybe factor into winning it or certainly a top 10 finish? I think you can't count out Jordan Spieth. Uh, just the way that he can turn it on at any moment. And if he's playing at the top of his game, uh, he's going to be in the top five, top 10. He's that good of a player when he's really, really on. Uh, he's just been inconsistent uh, more than I would like to see up to this point in the season to say that I think he's going to finish in that top 10, but I could see him on the maybe second page of the leaderboard, top 15, top 20 finish. Uh, I, I think maybe early on he might jump out to uh, an early lead or be up near the top in the first couple of days, but it just seems like Every time that he does that, he has a bad Saturday or he slips early in the front nine on Sunday. He just does something to take himself out of contention, and I think that's what he's got to figure out how to get through that. Here's another guy I throw out to you, Jason Day. Man, he was so close to winning majors a few years ago. He's a 25-1 to 1, uh, favorite going into this weekend. Jason last year had a miserable year because he was hurt. I think he's much healthier, and here's the key. You know who he's on his, who's on his back this week? Stevie Williams. Ooh. And a lot of the problems I think that Jason Day has had in recent years, mentally in big tournaments, Stevie Williams is going to neutralize that. Definitely. He hits a bad shot. That shot maybe doesn't turn into a double bogey. Stevie Williams, with his wisdom, can talk him back down to a par or a bogey. And I think limit the damage, something that Jason Day has not had uh, in the last year and a half when he's really been struggling. Yeah, that he's one of those guys where, again, he can be playing as good as anybody in the field and then go double, bogey, triple, and then put himself completely out of the tournament. Just he has one bad shot that leads to another, and then he can't get it out of his head for the next hole and just completely throws his whole uh, four days – uh, off in just one little 30 minute burst. And so having somebody that knows what they're doing, that can calm him down, that can really just right the ship whenever it starts to veer off, who knows? He definitely has the talent to win a major and to win at Pebble Beach. Uh, it's just can he put four rounds like that together and uh, stave off some of these other guys who you know are going to be shooting some low numbers. If you've forgotten about Stevie Williams, which if you're a golf fan, I can't believe you have, but he was, of course, on the bag for 13 of Tiger Woods' 15 major championship wins. KP, it's kind of amazing how we forget about guys with just a bad tournament or a bad stretch. You know, I remember when we were talking about the Masters back in April and two guys that we both really liked a lot were Justin's. Justin Rose and Justin Thomas both are listed down as far as the odd makers are concerned in terms of chances to win this tournament yeah it's just that's i mean that's kind of the nature of golf you pick the who the hot hands are but that's why what's fun about golf is you know justin thomas can step up there and win the tournament by four strokes and you make a lot of money if you go bet on him so i i mean he's always a guy you can't bet against so I'm with him. If if you if you told me, hey, he's got a good shot to to win this tournament, I wouldn't put up any argument to say otherwise. So I think he's got a good shot. But uh, again, that's the beauty of golf is it can be anybody's game any weekend. You like any long shots? Well, of those two that you just mentioned, I will say Justin Thomas is a guy that it's hard to think of him as a long shot. Though. Yeah, <laughs> especially in the U.S. Open, that game. The, the style of play that it requires to win a U.S. Open, Justin Thomas fits that very well. You have to be very accurate, hit it in the fairway. If you get off in the rough, they generally will grow the rough up even more to make it very punishing for players. So if he can keep it just right down the middle like he always does and just kind of putter along, 
who knows? I was saying we're going to see these guys shoot low numbers, but with, since the fact that it is a U.S. Open, I'm going to be interested to see the course layout, kind of what uh, are they setting this thing up where it's the first to 20 under wins, or is it going to be, you know, if you get to double digits, you pretty much have the tournament wrapped up. Uh, I, I think more of the latter, uh, we're going to be seeing – some guys have to grind out some shots. And by the and way, the USGA doesn't like double digits. Either. Not at all. So that's kind of what I'm thinking is uh, maybe we see Justin Thomas go out there and all he has to do is shoot one or two under every day. And he can probably do that uh, and be right there in contention. Uh, Justin Rose, not so much. I, I don't think he's really been as consistent. I think just because it's the Masters, because of the mystique of Augusta National, that golf tournament will always be my favorite to watch, KP. Mm. But I guess I am I, I like to see golfers look like us, hacks. And there's yeah. one golf tournament that can make them look like hacks and go to their knees quickly, and that's the, the U.S. That's Open. The, that's the viewers quickly forget <laughs> tournament. Oh, I can do that. Now tell, go sit down and watch the U.S. Open. That's I'm with you, Todd. Again, I love watching Augusta National. I love the green. I love the yellow. I love the colors. I love the azaleas. All, all Everything that comes with the Masters, I love. But I also love to watch the golfer struggle a little bit and make it not look so easy. And I'll be honest, when I see a final score, you know, 23 under, I don't like that. not a big fan of that. I, see, because I think, then it just reminds me of something I'll also never be able to do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's it's one of the most humanizing uh, Exa- golf tournaments excellent. on the planet. Humanizing, excellent word, Cassidy. Hey, uh, I'm gonna br- well, one thought. This will catch you by surprise. Fishing. How's the fishing going this year? I mean, with all the rain we've had, it's been tough to be. That's honest. what I thought. The bite's been really hard to predict this year. Um, muddy waters, uh, inconsistent water temperatures. I mean, every guys that are above and beyond my level of fishing they make me feel better when they say they're struggling too so it's not just because i'm not as good as them it's because it's a tough year so fishing (laughs) is to kp what golf is to casting us so we're giving you a little u.s open preview in the muddy water there you go (laughs) speaking of which we've kind of given you an overview our thoughts on the upcoming u.s open golf tournament this week's vibland sports fan poll Question of the week. Pretty simple. Who wins the U.S. Open? Is it A, Brooks Kepka, B, Dustin Johnson, C, Tiger Woods, or is it D, The Field? Log on to at Vibland Sports on Twitter. We'd like to hear what you think. You've kind of heard our thoughts on this, and we'll give the uh, answers away or the results next week on our final episode before we go on about a month and a half, two-month break until early to mid-August. The Twitter world, or excuse me, the podcast world is jumping up and down. I'm telling you that everyone else is going to have a chance now uh, to catch us in uh, in what we're doing and uh, and mm-hmm. everything that uh, that we're trying to do over here at Vibeland Sports. But in, here in a couple weeks, uh, this will be our final uh, episode after the U.S. Open, and then look, we'll have some more uh, bonus pods and stuff like that coming out throughout the summer, I'm sure. We even have a special series that we're looking to unveil, and uh, I think that can be pretty cool. I mean, you might get a chance to see the beginning of that, or at least some previews of it coming up very soon. In fact, we're going to do that in our third segment, but up next, we'll talk to former big leaguer Mickey Tettleton. That's coming up next. This is episode 25 of Vibland Sports, a weekly production of Vibland Media. Hi, we are Vibland. We are a creative network fostering and cultivating growth amongst a community of artists and innovators. Here at HQ, we inspire young entrepreneurs to pursue their ideas and fulfill their highest ambitions. From producing albums to shooting multimedia content to our involvement with various charitable organizations within our local community, we seek to empower and spread knowledge through open source innovation. We here at Vibland look forward to the future and hope you will join us on this exciting journey. Create, innovate, educate. Vibland. Welcome back to segment two of episode 25 of Vibland Sports. I'm Todd Miller. Today's guest is a 14-year Major League veteran of the Oakland Athletics, Baltimore Orioles, Detroit Tigers, and Texas Rangers. He's a member of Oklahoma State's Baseball Hall of Fame. He's Oklahoma City Southeast High School native Mickey Tettleton. Mickey, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm good. Nice to be with you guys. 
All right, let's talk briefly about your major league career because there's a lot of other things I want to get to. 14 years, you did a lot at the big league level, but if I would ask you your longevity, is that the thing you're most proud of? Oh, there's no doubt. I, I mean, I think when you you look at it, you look at the major league baseball average of uh, guys being there for a couple of two or three years. And, um, you know, you, you look at that, and that's by far. Um, I'm, I'm proud of the other stuff too. You know, the Silver Slugger is an All Star, but uh, to be able to stay, say you stayed in the game that long, um, is is something that I'm by far really proud of. And you did it kind of being a late bloomer, wouldn't you say? I mean, you had an all right career at Oklahoma State, but you really took off after your uh, first stint with the Oakland Athletics. Yeah, there's no question. And, um, you know, whether I uh, grew up and learned how to hit or, uh, you know, just my body developed uh, where I got stronger, uh, whatever the case was, I got more consistent playing time. Uh, I played all the time at Oklahoma State, don't get me wrong, but. Uh, in the in the big leagues, I got more consistent playing time the uh, the longer I stayed up there, and that's uh, always important because it's it's hard. To, this is a hard game, and uh, if you're going out there once or twice a week and trying to hit big league pitching, uh, it, it's not real easy. And so uh, when I when I was able to get a chance to play every day, you know, you still have to produce, but uh, at least the the rhythm and timing of hitting became a lot easier. You were a power hitter. You had four seasons in which you hit 30 or more home runs at the big league level. You also had a very good keen eye at the plate, almost 950 career walks. Mickey, does it bother you today the way players are hailed as being superstars when they strike out two to 300 times a year, despite the fact that they can hit the big fly? Well, I think it's just the way that the game is right now. It's a, it's a power game. You, you're looking at power arms from pitchers. Um, you know, you, you look at hitters that are better power hitters. And what I don't, uh, uh, you know, really like is they're, you know, they're saying that they're lifting everything in the air and trying to hit everything in the air. Watch the game here a couple of nights ago and there, there must have been 10 fly ball out and, and a dozen hitters. So, um, that, that's one thing, you know, I have a little bit of an issue with, but, you know, not really. I mean, I was a guy, I struck out, you know, quite a bit too. And, you know, I do think that there are times, though, when you have to put the ball in play and a, a simple ground ball will, will score your team a run. So um, that part of it, um, I, you know, I'd like to see them, you know, maybe cut down just a little bit, not try to hit every ball completely out of the ballpark. Your pro career kind of coincided with when I was growing up, and that's the way I look at baseball. I mean, where you you hit for average, you didn't strike out. There weren't a lot of big fly hitters. Do you recognize the game today professionally from the one that you played? Because not only is strikeouts, I mean, tolerated, but there's so much specialty to pro baseball today. Well, there's. I think it became more of a specialized deal when. Uh, you know, I know Tony La Russa is one of the greatest managers I ever played for. And, uh, you know, he took a lot of heat for really starting to specialize the bullpen. You know, when he was looking at his lineup card in the sixth inning, and he's trying to match up his bullpen to where the opposing team's lineup was. And, you know, Tony was, was the guy that, that really probably started all that with the, the setup guys and stuff like that. And the man was brilliant, I thought. But, um, no, I mean, not really. I, I think that when you look at at anything, if, if the game has changed, I really don't like the way the players act. <laughs> yeah. You know, when they're, you, we got bat flips on, uh, you know, April 5th and stuff like that. If you want to do it in the playoffs, that's fine. But uh, that part of it, I, I do have a problem with, you know, all the stuff that uh, they're doing on the bases after they hit a home run. It just that wouldn't have gone over. Uh, you know, you did that to somebody like Roger Clemens, then you're going to have a bruise on you the next time up. You and I had a chance to talk recently, and you were telling me about the Major League Baseball lifestyle. And, well, a lot of people think it's very, very glamorous, and I guess there are parts to it that are glamorous. It's a tough lifestyle that really can lead to a lot of problems after baseball. Isn't that true? Well, it, it's tough on families during the season because, you know, at the beginning of the season in spring training, uh, if you don't live in that town, your your family is staying behind. You know the kids are are not getting out of school till late May, um, till maybe first of June at some point. So you've already got a lot of the season uh, behind you once it starts, and then they're having to leave early. Plus the travel that uh, you're doing all the time. I mean it's 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 very easy travel. Granted, we get on charter planes. We got buses that just drive us right up to the back of the plane. We get on. 
But uh, at the same time, there's you know not a lot of people that would see you getting into uh, Dallas Fort Worth Airport at six o'clock in the morning and then uh, turn around and playing a game that next night. You know, twelve hours later. So uh, that part of it um, is a little bit tough. And then, and then just playing every day, the the mental and, and physical grind. It's not the most physically demanding sport, but after a while, it does take a toll on your body. And you know, my body is, is obviously. Um, had 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 its bumps and bruises. I've had eleven knee operations and uh, some other things. So it, uh, it it can leave a toll on you physically. How difficult is it to be a catcher at the big league level? Uh, it's a lot easier than it is being in the minor league level. <laughs> <laughs> oh, at my. that level, um, you know, it, to me, it's the best position on the field. You're involved in every pitch. Uh, obviously, it's the most physically demanding position because of the the foul tips, the things that you can't control. But when you look at the pitchers that you have an opportunity to work with and the guys that, that have just pinpoint control, uh, it's a lot easier catching up there than it is in the minor leagues where the lights are not quite as good and you got guys that are throwing harder and they're throwing all over the place. Who would you say have been some of your favorite teammates over the years? Oh, man. Kurt Gibson, Alan Trammell. Seth Fielder in Detroit, down in Texas, Will Clark, Rusty Greer, uh, Dean Palmer. I mean, the list just goes on and on. I mean, I had an opportunity to, uh, at, when I first came up in Oakland, that's where kind of guys were going to retire. So I saw Joe Morgan's last hit. I saw Reggie Jackson's last hit. Uh, caught Dave Stewart out there being in Baltimore, Cal Ripken Jr., Eddie Murray. I mean, the list it just goes on and on. I mean, I really can't put my finger on uh, – on one guy, just trying to throw out some names uh, from each and every team. Did you play for Earl Weaver in Baltimore? No, I didn't. I played for Frank Robinson. Okay, all right. I was uh, Earl Weaver, though, is certainly a character inning. Oh yeah, there's no, there's no doubt. I think that uh, you know some of the tirades that he went on and uh, some of the things that he did getting kicked out of games. I mean, you still see highlights of that stuff, and uh, uh, a lot of it was really funny. Uh, you know, probably not funny to Earl at the time, but when you sit back and look at it now and just see the stuff that he did, it was pretty comical. That to me, Mickey, is one area that baseball has changed, the personalities. Don't you agree? I mean, back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there were a lot of personalities in baseball. Oh, there's no question. And, I, you know, I think the guys are, you know, they're trying to do that now the best they can. And that's one of the things that, you know, when you look at the home run hitting contest, I mean, you know, guys don't wear hats anymore and stuff like that. That you know, just little things to a, a an old school guy like me that that I noticed. But I mean, you know, they they are trying to have some characters in the game, and baseballs have major league baseballs having a hard time right now because of what they're having to go up against. You know, late in the year with the playoffs, they're going up against college football and the NFL. Early in the year, like right now, they're going up against the NBA Finals. So baseball's in a tough place right now. And I don't think they're really marketing their big players the way that they should. I mean, you don't ever see Mike Trout on TV as much as he should be and, and, and used in a marketable way. Totally agree with you. I think if Mike Trout went to an average American city and walked down the streets of that city's downtown, most people wouldn't even recognize him. You put a pro football player, basketball player there, they're going to recognize them instantaneously. That's a problem, but is the length of the game also a problem as well? Well, I, you know, I think that's been one thing great about baseball, though. Um, you know, we were never up against a clock. We were yeah. always unique and, and separate from the other sports. And now they're trying to speed the game up. Well, when you watch some of these replays, the replays are taking forever. And so that's time that the game could be, uh, be played. So I think with baseball, uh, you get two good pitchers. You could be there for an hour and 45 minutes. If you get a slugfest, you could be there for four hours. And that was, to me, one of the things that made us stand alone from other sports. That we were never up against the clock. Um, and, and we had, you know, basically our own rules. I mean, they're talking about taking the shift out and stuff. That's part of strategy. So what are they going to do next? Same 2 -oh count, this is all you can throw. So uh, I understand, you know, what they're trying to do. But if I was an owner... I'd want those people sitting there as long as possible because they keep going to the concession stands. 
That's exactly right. Mickey Tettleton, former big league player and soon to be Oklahoma Sports Hall of Famer, our guest here on episode 25 of Vibland Sports. I want to transition into that, Mickey. Uh, that has to be a real honor for you. I mean, to be honored by your home state as one of the all time greats and uh, great athletes uh, going into the Hall of Fame. Well, it's very humbling. And I think that uh, whenever, you know, you set out as a young kid and I think you talked to all the uh, the men and the women uh, with Patty Gasso going in this year as well. Uh, I don't think any of us set out to be in the Hall of Fame. I think we all just set out to, to be at the highest level, do the best that we could and, and enjoy what we do. And uh, I mean, it's just it's so humbling uh, to be going into the class that I'm going in with, especially. It's just uh, it's unbelievable when you when you look at the names, Bob Stoops, Patty Gasso. You know, Mike Moore, Will Shields, an NFL Hall of Fame. I mean, uh, the list is just incredible, and I'm just very honored to be part of it. You grew up at Southeast High School in Oklahoma City, home of Bobby Mercer. Um, did you ever and dream- Darryl, and Daryl Porter? That's exactly right. That and that's a good one because he's a royal. Um, I'm well, sure you and, I- and Gerald McCoy too. The um, the now New Panther, Carolina. <laughs> Mickey, you're going down on the list if you keep talking about all these people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> did you? I, I'm sure you didn't specialize in high school. At what point of your career did you decide, "Hey, I'm gonna be a big league baseball player," or not a big league baseball player, but I have a, a future in this sport? Uh, in my backyard, when I was about eight or nine, throwing golf ball off the back of the house and fielding ground balls. You know, I think that's where all the dreams began. Uh, the reality of it uh, was, you know. Um, after my junior year at Oklahoma State, and, you know, couldn't be more thankful for, for Coach Ward and Coach Holiday for everything that they did for me at Oklahoma State. And you know, honestly, couldn't be prouder of the Cowboys for what Josh and those guys have been able to accomplish. But uh, uh, I think that when it first really clicked in is when I got put on the 40 man roster after being in A ball and uh, went to double A the next year and got called up from double A halfway through the season. And, you know, the first place I walked into is uh, Kansas City, and that was back when, uh, you know, the Royals, as you well know, were uh, were rolling with Brett and all those guys. And uh, it was just uh, uh, a dream come true and just, uh, you know, but reality hits you right in the face when you walk in and see those guys. You played at Oklahoma State. As I mentioned, you had a good career. You're a member of the school's Baseball Hall of Fame. But as you've gotten older, Mickey, do you appreciate more that era that you played in, the success the Cowboys had, the dominance they had in the Big 8 Conference, and having the opportunity to play for a guy like Gary Ward? No, no question. I, I know uh, TH being up here over the last few days, and you know, Randy Whistler is, one of the, is on the coaching staff up here in the Cape as well. You know, we've had an opportunity to kind of reminisce about some stuff. And um, the 1981 team was the first team that went back to the College World Series. And just everything that uh, that Coach Ward and Coach Holiday did for us as, as players to get us ready to not only go out and, and play professional baseball, but send us out into the world. I mean, it's just, uh, it's something that, you know, you'll never forget. And, um you know, to be part of that, and when people talk about one of the greatest streaks that I think never gets talked about, 16 straight Big yeah. 8 championships, that's hard to do. And um, so when you when you look at that and you look at all the accomplishments and then where Oklahoma State baseball is now and the way that Josh and, and Rob and those guys up, up there embrace the tradition because they were part of that tradition, uh, and to be bringing people back, it's it, it's really special to see uh, what Oklahoma State is doing, and, and when people ask you where you played college baseball, you can say Oklahoma State. It's just, uh, it's a very proud feeling, um, you know, to know at one time you were part of that. I know that as an alum of the program, you're excited about the future with Josh and the new stadium coming uh, open next season. But you also have to be a little bit uh, sad to see old Alley P. Reynolds Stadium close, don't you? Yeah, but it's you know, it's, I mean, it's a sign of the times. Yeah. It was an, it was a nice place, but. Uh, you know, uh, college baseball and in the direction that it's going, it's like, it's like everything else in college sports. Facilities are extremely important. And, um, you know, for for Coach Holder and those guys to be able to get this thing done and uh, get the stadium that they're going to have, is just, it's going to be incredible. I mean, there, there will not be anything that will be missed. And um, I can't wait to see it open and, and uh, just see what it's all about. Just go up there and walk around. Josh is... Uh, 
kept me updated with, um, you know, pictures and videos and stuff like that. And it's just, it's going to be immaculate. And I can't wait to see the finished product. I want your take on the state of college baseball. I, I love baseball. It's my favorite sport, but I have to be honest with you, Mickey. I'd almost rather watch a college softball game because it's cleaner. It's shorter. I mean, I watch some of these games and these 18 tournaments now, like the big 12 conference, and you've got games going four plus hours long. That's just too much. Has it become almost yeah, unwatchable? It, it, it is in a lot of ways because I, I think that even though the higher levels that you get into the division one, the game is played a lot cleaner and there's, and the, the players are, are better on a whole. Um, I do think that, you know, when you're looking at it, you've got pitching coaches that are calling pitches. So if you watch a game, you're, there's a long time in between pitches and that's, you know, catchers are getting their sign. Then they got to relay the pitcher. He doesn't like it. And, and, uh, that type of stuff, uh, I think the decision making, you know, as far as the, the rhythm of the game, getting offensive plays in and stuff like that are a little bit slower. Um, but you know, you got to remember these are college kids too. So, um, you know, they're, they're going to take their time on a, on a few more things, but, especially on TV where the game can uh, kind of lull you to sleep and you're going to say, well, let's watch something else. But I think overall, if people have an opportunity to get out and watch some of these kids and watch the athletes that they are, they would be really impressed uh, with college baseball and just the way that these guys have developed as players. If anybody gets a chance to, to stand next to Oklahoma State's team, you'd think that their football team got off the bus. I mean, they are a big physical team. Um, but I, I think college baseball, is, it's gaining ground. And I think, to, you know, thanks to TV and, and stuff like that, it's gaining ground. And I, I do think where they, they are losing it is, you know, the, the regionals, the super regionals in the College World Series, that's a long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, they are losing some people there. Do you think, and I don't think it'll ever happen for several reasons, but do you think – Let's just use the Big 12, for example, that maybe conference postseason tournaments need to be reduced from eight to maybe even as few as four. Well, I don't really understand conference postseason tournaments anyway. And what I really don't like about them, and you had some teams uh, this year that played good for four days and got into the postseason. So you have a team, and this happened to Oklahoma State a couple of years ago. They came in as the eighth seed. They won the tournament, and they were very, very questionable about going to a regional. And now they're an automatic bid. That's one of the things I really do not like. I like more of the body of work. Uh, the regular season should count for more than you know the four days. But uh, I, I don't really understand it. If they're going to do it, and, you know, maybe make it a single elimination and invite all the teams in the conference. I don't, I don't like when teams get left behind. You can speed it up uh, by making it a single elimination. All right, you've done a lot to stay close to the game since you've retired in, in 1997, but now you've embarked on broadcasting. Um, how has that uh, foray into that that profession been for you? <laughs> it's a blast. Um, you know, it, it it certainly looks a lot easier from the booth. Yeah. You know, I know I know it's not, and but it's uh, it's a blast because you're just getting an opportunity to uh, uh, relay to people what you see and hopefully pass on a few stories along the way and just uh, you know try to to uh, give people an insight as to what possibly might be happening within the game of what just did happen with uh, within the game. And to me, it's been a whole lot of fun, and you know. Really, too, the, the people, the, the play-by-play guy makes it so much easier for me. And I've had an opportunity to, to work with Chad McKee and Bill Doman in the Big 12 tournament and uh, did a little bit of radio with Toby Rowland, which I think is unbelievably good. And those guys make it so much easier because they set you up so well. And uh, then from there, you're just, you're just telling, you, telling what the monitor's telling you. How's that uh, been working with the University of Oklahoma? Well, I uh, I did have to wear an OU shirt, and there was a, a lot of people. Good for you. That even well, there was even OU fans that were asking me, uh, that, uh, "Do they really make you wear that shirt?" And I tell them, "Yeah, but I've got an orange one on underneath." It. So. Has that transition been hard at all? Going from from being a diehard 
loyal and true cowboy to, to actually having to be, or at least play the role of a homer for the University of Oklahoma? No, not at all. Because, it, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity for me to, to uh, have another adventure. And so uh, the folks down there at OU, they were great. And Joe Castiglione and uh, those guys down there, they're, they're first class. And No, it, it wasn't hard at all. I lived right there in Norman, so it was a very easy commute. Uh, you know, I'm always going to be loyal to Oklahoma State, but – at the same time, you know, I root for Oklahoma. I'm not one of those, you know, diehards that does not root for Oklahoma because I know a bunch of those coaches. and They've not only been really good to me, but like Bob Stoops and Lincoln Riley were really good to my son, Tyler, uh, having him be a graduate assistant at Oklahoma, and now he's with the Cleveland Browns. So, um, you know, like I said, whenever um, they're not playing the Cowboys, I'm, I'm a Sooners fan. So, and I think it's really cool for both teams in both schools in the state of Oklahoma when they're having success. How did you get into broadcasting? Somebody pick up the phone and say, hey, Mickey, you want to come help us? Yeah, I was doing a little bit of radio with uh, with uh, Randy Heights and the franchise and still doing that. And um, the next thing you know, they called and said, hey, we need a fill-in for uh, George Frazier to do a Big 12 game. And I went down and, and uh, did a 9 o'clock in the morning game. And uh, OU called me the next year and, and said, uh, do you mind coming and doing some uh, games for us? And I said, heck yeah. And so it's it's been a, a lot of fun. That's cool. I've heard your work. You do a good job. You mentioned your son, Thank Tyler. You. A lot of people know him from his days at, at Norman North, went to Ohio University, had a very good career there under Frank Solich, the former University of Nebraska quarterback. But when I talked to you a month or two months ago, you were excited because he's now working uh, with the Browns, an up-and-coming franchise in the NFL, as you just touched on. Yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, you look at them and they, they might be the talk of the town. I mean, <laughs> how many times can you say that about the Browns? Right. But uh, he's really excited to be over there. Him and Baker Mayfield have a great relationship. So he's over there. He's working with the – he's a quality control coach. He, he still gets to sit in on the meetings and do some coaching. But he's with the uh, uh, wide receivers and the quarterbacks. And he was scouting with the Jets, but uh, I'm I'm happy for him because it gets him back out on the field and gets him back in joint. Jim Shorts is, you know, what he's done his entire life. So he's having a blast doing it. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, you don't know where it's going to lead, but uh, right now he, he's having a really good time doing what he's doing. You mentioned two words that I find funny because timing in life is everything. Quality control used in the same sentence as the Cleveland Browns. He actually has a job that you can control the quality now. Before now, that might have been an extinct position. Don't you agree? Yeah, it's probably just about more control and not quality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's basically an offensive position without, you know, if they need an offensive coordinator or something like that or wide receivers coach. He's right there with them, and he's basically, you know, assisting the quarterback's coach. So it's um, – it's it's great, and like I said, I don't know what's going to happen with it. He doesn't either, but he's having a blast right now, and uh, uh, it's kind of cool for me because every time they show the Browns on ESPN, you can see him out there with his hat turned around backwards, and uh, so it's, it's fun for me to be able to watch their their practices and highlights and stuff. I know, Mickey, you're very proud of all of your kids, but it's apparent that you never forced your profession upon them. I mean, Tyler was a quarterback. You have another son that's a, a soccer player, isn't that right? Yeah, he just made the All-State team. They'll have the All-State game here in a couple of weeks. He's actually going to go to Oklahoma Christian and play soccer. And uh, No, I never did. And both of them actually played um, baseball, but they both could, could run. So they got stuck in center field when they were young. And, uh, you know, they were both the, the dandelion-picking kid out there. <laughs> so they got bored with it. It was too slow for them. And, uh, you know, Tate just he kept working and working at, uh, at soccer. and. Uh, it's it's worked out good for him so far. So I'm really excited to see uh, where his career is going to go at, at Oklahoma Christian playing soccer. You mentioned Oklahoma Christian. That was my next question for you. You end up on Lonnie Cobble's staff this past uh, spring as the hitting coach. I know you love working with young kids, but you never ventured into the college level as far as instruction was concerned. You liking that gig? Oh, I love it. I love working with this age group. I think that uh, they're all eager to learn. They're sponges. You know, even these kids up here uh, in the Cape, you know, you've got some of the best Division One players in the country. 
they're all eager to learn, and, and that's what I enjoy doing is the teaching and the development side of it. I enjoy the games too, but you know, for me, you know, being down in the cage trying to fix a swing or uh, not necessarily even fixing a swing, but trying to make a swing better, and uh, that that's the part that really I enjoy the feedback from the kids and. You know, whenever they're, um, you know, they're calling you and, and uh, texting you and asking you questions, that's, that's very gratifying for me. And we've got, you know, one kid there at Oklahoma Christian that I didn't really appreciate his text yesterday because he's a Texas Tech fan. So <laughs> uh, I, I had a few choice texts for him on the way back. So how did that all come about? I mean, may, maybe it had been in the works for a while, but I was surprised last spring when I see they fired you as their hitting coach. Well, it just uh, I was I was working with the summer program, working with some high school kids, and I was just sitting in the stands one day for practice at OC, and uh, you know I just looked over at Lonnie and I said, you know, Lonnie, that we were talking, and I said, you know, this is the level I'd really like to coach in college, and uh, you know, Lonnie kind of quickly turned his head over and he said, really, and I said, yeah, he said, well, you know, maybe we can do something. And I said, hey, that's that's fine if you know nothing happens if. if you hear of an opening because uh, Lonnie Cobble is one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Without a doubt. And, and, um, he said, you know, I'll keep my eyes and ears open for you. If something happens, then I'll let you know. And, and he called me, um, right after they got back from Christmas break and he goes, okay, let's go. Um, you know, we can, we're going to try to make this thing happen. And so that's about it. And, um, you know, the rest is kind of history. Got out there and got to know the kids and, uh, it's great for OC and great for Hunter Markwood, a kid that played center field for us. He was drafted in the 13th round by the Phillies. So he's going to go play professional baseball. And I think that's great for OC. And, uh, it's, a, it's a great, uh, I've been really, really pleasantly surprised at the level of players and the level of, of the game that, that's played there. Now they don't have quite the depth. Uh, like a Division One school does, but I tell you, overall, you know, coming out and watching you guys when we had that twenty-one seventeen oh, game at, uh, <laughs> there, when, you know, when we played OBU, but uh, it uh, the the level of play and the quality of player was it was a very pleasant surprise. I was going to ask you about Marquardt. Uh, having been around the big league game, does he have a future being drafted thirteenth round? Is he a guy that can can stick around for a while? Oh, absolutely. Because he's not, he's not going to be the traditional player that they have now. You know, he's not a corner outfield guy that is going to hit 20, 25 home runs, but the kid can flat out fly. The, the Padres were there working him out one day and he ran in somebody else's shoes and he ran a six, three, five, sixty. Wow. And, um, he can flat fly. He can hit. He plays a really good center field with a strong arm. So he has, I think, every chance in the world to play in the big leagues because he brings an element that you can't coach, and that's speed. And um, he and he, he can be a really good defensive outfielder, and he can just, you know, he can turn a bunt single into a triple by stealing second and third. This this kid is, uh, he's got a really good skill set, and uh, you know, hopefully he can he can take it and, and keep growing with it. You spent the spring at Oklahoma Christian. You're in the Cape, uh, coaching the Cape Cod League. Do you eventually want to go higher up, coach at a different level? Um, or are you content doing what you're doing? No, I think we all want to be at the highest level. And, you know, right now I'm just very grateful for OC giving me the opportunity to do it. And, you know, if nothing comes of it, I'll, I'll go back to OC and we'll, you know, we'll uh, try it all over again. But uh, I think, you know, deep down inside, we all want to be at the highest level. I don't want to be in pro ball. You know, unless it's the big leagues, then that's that's different. I really enjoy uh, this level because of what I mentioned a while ago, the teaching and the developing side of these players. And, uh, you know, just being able to, to talk to them uh, about some of the things that, that happened to me in the big leagues, being able to relate onto them. And, you know, hopefully one of the, these days we'll see these kids in the big leagues and after their career's done, they'll 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 pass the torch on to somebody else, just like I'm trying to do. So, Mickey, are we going to see a new generation of the Tettleton batting stance? <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but, you I, know I, what? It's, it's, it's just like, I, you know, I tell everybody, when you look at a guy like Julio Franco, who was completely opposite of me, he had it stuck over his head, and, and, you know, obviously I had the bat laid out flat. Whenever we went to swing the bat or launch the bat, our front foot hit the ground. We were both in the same place. 
So it's really not about where you start. It's about where you are when you get ready to swing it. So uh, I think there's all sorts of unique stances and uh, different ways to, to set up, but there are there are common things within the swing that we all have to do. How did you develop that stance? I just got tired and holding that up. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is an awesome answer. All right, last question. I will let you go because I know you got a lot to do. Um, you spend a lot of time on the golf course. You play at Oak Tree, hang out with the Oak Tree gang. Uh, any wagers on any sides or anything? They they give you a bunch of strokes? No, not at all. They don't. Well, that doesn't make me right. happy at all. Huh? That's not right. No, it's not at all. But uh, it's, it's, I tell you, it's a wonderful opportunity to to play Oak Tree National every day. Well, not every day now, but to be able to go up there and play one of the top courses in the country and the tradition that it has, and then to be able to play with the guys like Willie Wood and Scott LaPlank and Bob Tway and, you know, all the other young players, Ren Gibson, who just won a, uh, a web tournament here this past weekend. I mean, it's just, uh, it's a phenomenal place. They all love to, uh, to go out and play golf. So, I mean, if you're a golfer, it's, it's the place to go. And then just the condition of the golf course and just the quality of the golf course itself. It's just, it's unbelievable. And it's just, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun going up there. We got a lot of fun games, good guys to play with, but, uh, you know, unfortunately they're going to have to wait to take my money for a few more weeks. So <laughs> till I get back, I'm, I'm sure that they will be okay in the pocketbook until they can get your, uh, your spare change. Huh? Have you always been, been well, a golfer? Yeah. Well, I got a little bit of theirs too. So well, that's good to hear without strokes on a side, huh? Not any. Wow. Have you always been a golfer or have you really started to take it up and, and, and get a lot better since you've retired? No, I played since I was a kid. Um, a long, long time. So it's, it is, uh, it's a passion of mine. It's, it's, I love doing it. It's, uh, it changes every day. Um, and that's what I, I really enjoy about it. And just, uh, it's just, I love being outside. And so the winter time gets a little hard on, on my marriage because I turn into a little bit of a pest <laughs> when I can't, when I can't get outside. My, my wife is always telling me that, uh, I've got to go find something to do. So whenever the weather's nice, I try to head to the golf course. How about bowling? No, never been much into that. I've done it, but uh, never been much into that. Uh, like I said, I enjoy being outside too. Like bowling is hard, dude. It you know, is hard. It, uh, whenever you watch these guys and, and, and what they're able to do, I mean, it's amazing what they can do with that, that uh, bowling ball. I'm not trying to date you, Mickey, but I bet when you first started playing golf, you literally hit a wood, didn't you? Oh, no question. With the steel shaft. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and playing a lot of golf balls that, uh, you know, you could put a nice little smile in them if you hit them just right. <laughs> That's awesome. I still do, and I don't hit wood. So, uh, Mickey, <laughs> thanks for t- f- taking the time to visit with us, man. It was great to meet you a few uh, weeks ago, and uh, looking forward to our paths crossing once more. Well, and I appreciate you guys taking the time. Be sure to tell your lovely bride I said hello, and, uh, um, you know, let's do it again sometime soon. All right, Mickey Tettleton, 14-year Major League Baseball veteran, our guest on Episode 25 of Vibland Sports. We'll be back to wrap up this week's edition right after this. And again, a big thank you to soon-to-be Oklahoma Sports Hall of Famer Mickey Tettleton for joining us on Episode 25 of Vibland Sports. We alluded to it's a star-studded class, a group of seven that includes former OU football coach Bob Stoops, former Lawton High School and NFL offensive lineman Will Shields, former Major League Baseball pitcher Mike Moore, also former college basketball coach Lou Henson, former Mustang OSU and Olympic wrestler Kendall Cross, and current University of Oklahoma softball coach Patty Gasso. So again, big thank you to Mickey for taking time to join us, and he did so from Cape Cod. How about that? Not a bad gig, is it? Pretty sweet. All right, Cassidy, I want to talk about something that maybe I shouldn't talk about because it's not official yet, but it's getting to be very, very close to being official. And it's something that it's probably going to be a project that we will do while we're away on our little hiatus during the summer. But we're planning a multi-part, maybe four, maybe five, maybe even as many as six episodes of a series with legendary Oklahoma sportscaster John Brooks. Of course, uh, many know John from the 70s and 80s as the voice of the University of Oklahoma Sooners. Some know him even just with the Blazers. And uh, we have recorded one episode. Uh, It was done as a demo, if you will. Um, 
By all accounts, Brooksy really enjoyed doing it. I think it was a surprise to him. He had never done a podcast oh, before, yeah. and uh, it turned out pretty well. But now we got some more work to do. Hopefully, this project will take off. Yes, and regardless of if we the series itself ends up happening, there's just some things that have to happen uh, behind the scenes to get everything in place for that to happen. If for some reason that doesn't, we still will release that first episode as just a bonus because it was so interesting and so good. Uh, but we want you guys to uh, to maybe have a chance to check out a little bit of uh, what that's going to sound like. What we're going to do is we're going to ask Brooksy anything and everything from his legendary career, from his beginnings to the end, his time at the University of Oklahoma with the Blazers. The guy has done so many historical firsts in terms of broadcasting at Oklahoma. All that is going to be covered in a multi-part series that, again, we hope will be a completed project after this summer and a release date coming up in the fall. But there's still a few more uh, strings to untie, if you will, to make that happen. But one of the things that I asked Brooksy was this. I said, how did you get your famous call, Jiminy Christmas? And it actually happened, as he describes, during a hockey game. Well, there was a real hot play around the net if I remember, and there was a scramble around the net, and the puck pops free, and there's, a, and there's a pass out to the point, and there's a booming slap shot from, I don't know, the right or left point, maybe the right point, doesn't make any difference, a booming slap shot from the point, and it ricochets off of the crossbar, just misses, huge moment in the game, and for some reason it ricochets off, and I go, Shot for the point, hit the post, Jimmy Christmas, what a close call for the Blazers, you know, something like that. And that's how it happened. Unreal. That's just a small sample of what we hope you will enjoy from this upcoming series. Again, it looks like it's going to be done, but already that first episode is recorded. You will hear it in its entirety, regardless if we have multi parts to it or not, but my money, Cassidy, is on the fact that we're going to hear a lot from Brooksy. I think so. And, man, that's going to be such a fun series. And just getting a chance to to talk with him a little bit on some road trips when we were uh, working on the same football broadcast a little bit the last couple of years. Uh, it's been amazing just to get to listen to you guys uh, talk about his career and uh, some – of the most interesting things I've ever heard uh, and the best stories about OU football or uh, hockey games, just stuff I didn't know much about. Uh, And John is going to really tell everybody all about it. I want to tell you this. I've done a lot of cool things in broadcasting, but having an opportunity to sit across the room in this studio with Brooksy, who is my broadcasting idol, and ask him questions, and the possibility of asking him anything I want about his career is just about as humbling of an experience, but yet the coolest thing I've ever gotten to do because uh, not many people ever meet your hero or the reason that you do a certain thing, and it looks like we're going to be able to do a multi-part series and ask John anything and everything that we want to ask him. What do you think, KP? I think it was awesome, Todd. You had to, like you said, for those that uh, listen to this show, I mean, Todd got to interview his idol. So, you know, like, be like Cassidy getting to sit down with Russell Westbrook. So, Woo! Tiger Woods, you know. So, it was a pretty cool situation and really cool to hear. Or you with Tom Osborne. Uh, you know, that would be my mom. That would, My mom would be Tom Osborne. I don't I was trying to think who my who I would love to just sit down and ask a million questions to. But you right were now, a Huskers my, fan for a long time. I think you up, could still ask some pretty good questions of Tom. Oh, I absolutely I could. Absolutely. I, I'd remind him uh, he, he's held me as a baby, I think, more than once. My mom very famously just would, like, put – when I was a baby, like, yeah, hold my baby and like take a picture of it. So like, I'm pretty sure Tom Osborne held me multiple times. <laughs> well, nobody <laughs> held me. I was dropped on my head. So. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what I, a- I was not an option when, uh, when I, he was, he kept me. So, you know, Tom Osborne was famous for the option offense. One other thing I want to promote coming up uh, on next week's podcast, episode 26, man, it's going to be a hoot. A oh, guest, man. unlike any other guest that we've had amongst the previous 25 plus bonus podcasts. There is a new Instagram account. It's called Tips from the Tips, and it is hosted by Ryan Engel. You ought to check it out. Ryan joins us on next week's episode 26, and he is hilarious. Oh, my goodness. It's it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic interview. He is so funny, and 
I love his approach to the game of golf. Uh, I probably take it a little more serious than he does, uh, but still the fact that he likes to have fun. I think anyone that enjoys the sport, anyone that just enjoys good conversation, they're, you're going to really like episode 26. It's really scary how much he and I's thoughts towards golf actually uh, <laughs> yes. mirror one another. All right, that's going to put a wrap on quarter century episode number 25. Hey. How about that? For Vibland Sports, for Cassidy and Kelby, I'm Todd. We'll see you again next week for episode 26 of Vibland Sports, a weekly media presentation of Vibland Media. Mm-hmm.